All right, I've been pointing out a new study that shows that uh, the genes responsible for a diversity of human skin colors has been identified, where you get the different pigments and stuff. This came out last year in October, so not quite a year ago. A uh, study of diverse African groups by geneticists has identified new genetic variants associated with skin pigmentation. These findings help explain the vast range of skin color in the African continent and sheds light on human evolution and inform an understanding of genetic risk factors for conditions such as skin cancer. And it's kind of what they were looking into first, but then again, quite often, whenever you're searching one thing, you find another. I do it in my research. They do it in theirs. So we're looking at all these type of factors and stuff. Now this lady, she's a Mersai woman uh, of Nilo-Saharan ancestry. So the Nilotic people, the, like the Nubians and the people that lived right near the Egyptians that were so dark. Um, Nilo-Saharan populist populations uh, possess some of the darkest skin in all of Africa. Researchers from the University of Pennsylvania found that mutations associated, associated with both light and dark pigmentations in a genome-wide association study of diverse African populations. You can see she, she's a Mersai, and so she does the body scarring that you see on her upper arm, but not on her face necessarily like some tribes do. Every tribe's got their own little things and their cultural identities from each other. Instead of doing the lip plates or things that you see in some other Africans, they do these giant ear dowels. So it's a different type of thing. And uh, probably from a distance, you can easily tell people apart from these type of things and stuff too. But that's not necessarily why they may have done it. So let's look into this a little bit more. Now I'm going to zoom in here a little bit and try to get uh, this right in the center for everybody so you can see it pretty good. Human populations feature a broad palette of skin tones, but until now, few genes have been shown to contribute to normal variation of skin color, and these had primarily been discovered through studies of European populations. So uh, through the Europeans and the people having the olive skin and the non-olive skin, and, and what it showed in the older test is that they had different types of melanin that were standing out a little bit more, and that caused the olive skin and so on like that. But once they took that knowledge and applied it here, it helped out a lot. Now, a study of diverse African groups led by the University of Pennsylvania geneticist has identified new genetic variants associated with skin pigmentation. And uh, these findings help explain the vast range of skin color in the African continent. And it sheds light on human evolution and the inform the understanding of genetic cancer, such as skin cancer. That's what we said before. It's word for word. I don't know why they put it down there again, but it's the lead in. We have identified new genetic variants that can contribute to the genetic basis of one of the most strikingly variable traits in modern humans, says Sarah Tishkoff. A pen, uh, a pen integrates knowledge professor. And uh, the David and Lynn Silfen University Press professor in genetics and biology with appointments in the Perlman School of Medicine and School of Arts and Sciences, or credentials. When people think of skin color in Africa, most would think of darker skin, but we show that within Africa, there's a huge amount of variation ranging from skin as light tone as some of the darkest agents to the darkest skin on a global level and everything in between. And we can see that. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people have chalked that up to perhaps being like a Caucasian intervention there a little bit. Uh, indeed, the African Americans are generally lighter than their West African counterparts. They have more alkaline features and things like that. That was from the Jewish slave masters and so on that everybody knows about. Let's not get into that at all. Um, but seeing those traits in people, people often thought those type of things, but then they found tribes that are all um, really had not had that influence upon them and showed a difference between those. And so that led us to believe something different. No one had any idea what it was. Genetics though, sometimes finds out things that, uh, you know, it's changing the world and changing the uh, ideals that we had on things. Genetics is ruining some old myths of people and things like that stuff too, and, and all these things. And we're about to ruin another myth right here. Uh, there's a myth out there that um, somehow that blue eyes and uh, light skin came about 8,000 BC. And uh, that's not true. Um, even in its essence, whenever you look at the paper and you'd say, okay, well, that man has a Y chromosome and an X that come down with this trait. 
and da da, he's got blue eyes and stuff, so they say this must be the first blue eyed man. Yet he's carrying that recessive trait in his body at that point. We now, other people, have studied into it and believe that we get some of those traits and colored eyes and stuff perhaps from Neanderthals. Uh, it could be as simple as uh, blue eyes come from Cro-Mags, but uh, the Neanderthals had green eyes. That red hair comes from Neanderthals, but blonde and brown hair comes from Cro-Mags. And then the mixing of those two shows you to point out, and a lot of people have thought that because there's less redheads and blondes and less blondes than brown hairs, and it just kind of makes a common sense to it. But let's look into this a little bit more and uh, see what we've got. So the findings are publishing in the Journal of Science. Tishkoff, senior author, collaborated with the first author and lab member, Nicholas Crawford. It's a, he's a postdoctoral fellow. A multi-institutional international team that they had on there. International team. Tishkoff has long studied the genetics of African populations, looking at traits such as height, lactose intolerance, bitter taste sensitivity, and high altitude adaption. Now, these are traits that they found in Europeans and that they had tested and, and found before uh, due to, you know, knowing the people and testing modern genetics and how this person doesn't have as much bitter taste and sneak. Some people can't handle a lemon. Other people, it's not so bad and all these type of things. They've also studied in the uh, Sherpa guides of the Himalayas and how they have a high altitude adaptation and then applying that towards northern Europeans seeing if they came from the mountains or not, and then there's bone measurements for your legs and things, and one would say it's more mountain adapted versus just flat terrain. And that's one way that they can easily just look at the bones of somebody and off some measurements can tell you, well, this was a white guy or a black guy or what's going on with it, things like that, because of those traits that people carry, and it's been so uh, strictly found that it's, uh, not even really in question anymore. The only question comes is when you get an overlapping and then you have to question it. You look at other factors. So looking at these different things, you know, lactose intolerance, this is um, uh, being able to tolerate milk and things like that. Well, uh, we're not supposed to be able to tolerate milk. And then geneticists have found that the early pastoralists had started and eventually got this going on to where they could be tolerant to milk all their life. Whereas you're supposed to go off mother's milk for a while and then your body starts rejecting it. Indeed, the people that are lactose intolerant today still carry that trait. So they got the flip of the switch. It is always supposed to be on, theirs is off. Well, that's okay. They just, you know, don't, you know, they be a little careful with ice cream, be a little careful with cheese and so on like that. And you're not going to be slamming big glasses of chocolate milk. That's fine. It doesn't make you any less of a human at all. One reason we try to get milk nowadays is because of the calcium and the vitamin D3 that's in it. Vitamin D3 helps keep things like uh, rickets from happening, which is where your knees give out and you turn backwards. You've seen these people with these backward legs and weird stuff. And that's a form of rickets. And uh, it's extremely uh, bad in African Americans because they do block the sun somewhat with their skin, almost like sunglasses. And therefore, they don't get as much sun. And indeed, if they don't sun quite often, they don't get enough vitamin D3. Well, amazingly, old American scientists way back when figured out a long time ago that vitamin C helps cure scurvy. And so they started carrying around uh, oranges and things like that on their voyages. You know, a couple of drums full of oranges and they'll make it back and forth and no one ends up getting scurvy from eating one certain kind of food or getting vitamin D, D or vitamin C deficient. The same thing would happen with vitamin D and they put it into milk for us. You always see it vitamin D milk. You see it in a lot of products and anytime you eat, you know, chicken and a biscuit crackers or you eat any of that stuff, it has vitamin D thrown in into it. Well, why does it have D3 thrown in there? Well, so we don't have that problem in our population. And of course, black people have it worse than whites. So you're welcome because uh, it could be real bad if you didn't have that extra effect. Um, and indeed, black people trying to live up north in certain areas are having this problem again, and they easily identify it. All they have to do is give you vitamin D3 supplements and you're through with it. So uh, it shows you that this kind of is one of the twists that they can find in the groups. And of course, they already studied these in Caucasians and people all through Asia and stuff. So then they're able to apply this to blacks. And then whenever they do, aha, 
Skin color is a classic variable trait in humans. It is thought to be adaptive, Tishkoff said. Analysis of the genetic basis of variation of skin color sheds light on how adaptive skin traits evolve, including those that play a role in uh, disease risk. And what we're saying here is uh, something very simple, that uh, if you took uh, Caucasian people and you put them in a high sun environment for a long period of time, they would start to develop a more olive and toned skin that the trait, uh, you would now start selectively choosing that versus the pale and getting sunburnt all the time out of common sense. And then that trait would build and it would start to become more of a population. You'd have more of an olive skin type people and it could get darker from there and unimelon and so on. But so that's how it kind of pulls in. And of course, they're again looking at disease risk of skin cancers and stuff. And black people get skin cancer. Um, not as often as whites, of course, but they still get kin skin cancer. I mean, uh, Bob Marley died of skin cancer, and skin cancer is much more evasive on Negroids, and it's uh, uh, usually a different type, and uh, quite often you, it looks like a mole or something, and you don't catch it until it's invaded your body and started to spread, and it can be very fatal. And so being able to identify this early in these traits of people who might have the problem you can take your little kid do a little cotton swab they do a test on it then they'll tell you hey be careful you kid because da 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 and you know and, and you would just know this and know be something you have to go around swathing on you know uh protectant or anything like that for necessarily but you would be conscious of the fact and try to keep from it and then of course any moles that show up because you know this you would be more adhere to this is all knowledge for the public so you don't go around thinking that Blacks are immune to skin cancer, and da da da, you know, because that's not true at all. It's just that because of their reflective skin, it's sometimes less evident. So, both light and dark skin pigments can offer, uh, can confer benefits. Darker skin, for example, is believed to help prevent some of the negative impacts of ultraviolet light exposure, while lighter skin is better able to promote synthesis of vitamin D3 in regions with low ultraviolet light exposure. So this is going along with the idea that people up north would need it and to be lighter. And so that would be a natural cause for it. And we're going to get into something here and shortly about it. But no, that, that, that would be an effect. And you'd say, okay, that makes great sense. Until you see the Eskimos and how dark they are. And you're like, what? And they've been there for so long that they haven't adapted out of it. Things show weird about stuff like that. So there's always anomalies. And then you have to reason through those anomalies, use logic and things like that. So to objectively capture the range of skin, range of skin pigmentation in Africa, Tishkoff and colleagues used a color meter to measure the light reflectance of skin of more than 2,000 Africans from ethnically and genetically diverse populations all over Africa. And they took the measurement from the inner arm uh, where sun exposure is minimal. Because why? Well, because black people do still tan. In fact, even that nilotic girl right there has a couple of shades lighter on her inside of her arms and nobody wants to take her pants down or something that hasn't actually been exposed to light. But I'm betting that's even the hair lighter than that, you know, just like tan lines and so on. Blacks don't act like you don't have tan lines and so on, especially the lighter blacks. You'll easily tan up. A lot of blacks avoid it. And that was where the problem comes with avoiding the sun to try to stay lighter because you don't like his dark skin, and in doing so, you might have a vitamin D3 deficiency, but nah, you don't. It's in everything. It's in quite a bit of things. I wouldn't say it's in everything. But uh, So they took the measurement of the inner arm where the sun is minimally exposed there. In white people that are tanned and pretty good over the summer here and stuff like that, you're lighter on the inside of your arms. Uh, the darkest skin was observed in Nilo-Saharan pastoralist populations in eastern Africa, and the lightest skin was observed observed in the San hunter gatherer populations in southern Africa. Now these people aren't pastoralists and they haven't even gotten to the edge of farming and stuff yet. They're still hunter gatherers yet they're lighter. Now that throws a little wrench into it too. So the, re the researchers obtained genetic information from nearly 1600 people examining more than 4 million single nucleotide polymorphs across the genome. Places where the DNA code may differ by even one letter. Uh, and that would cause a change uh, that you can go along. It's kind of like you have a ABCs going along and everybody has the same ABCs, but then all of a sudden your V is not in the right place and so on. There's a, there's a letter missing or it's slightly different. And that one little switch might mean something. They try to correlate the data and see if it does. 
and it does. It's like everybody's got the same thing with this slight click, 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 click in this one genome set. We'll get into it farther here. Um, from this data set, the researchers were able to do a genome-wide association study that found uh, four key areas of the genome where variation closely correlated with skin color differences. Now, the region, the strongest associations was in and around the SLC24A5 gene. So they put these nomenclatures and all the genes running through, and this is like locuses and things like that that they have. Uh, one variant of which is known to play a role in light skin color in Europeans and some southern Asian populations, and is believed to have arisen more than 30,000 years ago. So why do they say 8,000 years ago whites developed lighter skin whenever they have a genome set that shows that it must have been over 30,000 years ago? Well, it gets worse. We'll go ahead and look into it, or better, whichever way you're looking at it. This variant is common in populations in Ethiopia and Tanzania that were known to have ancestry from Southeast Asia and the Middle East, suggesting that it was carried into Africa from those reasons and based on its frequency may have been positively selected. So that's a key statement right there. One, it tells you that uh, the Eurasian population had gone into Africa in primordial times and there was some admix, but then those were been positively selected. So a good thing. Where they're going, no, 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 we want to stay what we are. It was kind of a, a good thing to select for these certain populations. By the way, when they talk about Southeast Asia, they're not talking about China and Japan and so on. Asia is the continent running all the way over here. So uh, when they talk about that, this is uh, like Sumerians and so on like that that they had done. It's another key that shows you Sumerians had come over because when they see Southeast Asia and the Middle East, Southeast Asia is those people. It can range over to India, but that's about it. Because um, it's Southeast Asia, not Southwest Asia. That would be all the way over at the Levant. Anyhow, suggesting it was carried into Africa by those regions, based on its frequency, it may have been positively selected. Another region which contains the MFSD12 gene had the second strongest association to skin pigmentation. Try to say that 10 times fast. This gene is expressed at low levels in depigmented skin and in individuals with vitiligo as a condition where skin loses pigment in some areas. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it. Michael Jackson uh, had vitiligo in a few spots on his body. And uh, then he started covering it with makeup. And then supposedly this is the reason he bleached himself all out to match his vitiligo. Uh, nowadays, they have uh, fancy tattooing where they can actually tattoo it. But of course, if it keeps growing and spreading, which quite often it does, then uh, you're going to end up with an outline line. You'll have to keep going in, doing all these type of things. Uh, Michael wore makeup over it, but of course, getting out and dancing, he would sweat his ass off and it would start coming off. There's a few pictures that do show it coming off on him. And uh, it's believed that the whole idea of the one glove was because that hand had a big splotch of vitiligo on it itself and then when he got up singing he would rub it and do things and all of a sudden boom it shows up he didn't like that so he's just going to cover it totally what does he do to cover it up he covers it up with one of his iconic signature things and no one's ever really why do you have just one glove on that's kind of silly no one would wear one glove it would be just kind of funny i mean you can cut the fingers out of gloves and so on but anyhow that's what he did so um anyhow i still remember the aha moment when we saw that this gene was associated with vitiligo, said Crawford. That's when we knew that we had found something new and exciting. The team found that mutations in or around this gene that were associated with dark pigmentation were present at high frequencies in populations of Nilo-Saharan ancestry. So the darkest people have this effect worse, which stands out, who tends to have very dark skin as well as across sub-Saharan populations, except the San, who tend to have lighter skin and the lighter skin sand don't seem to have vitiligo. So it seems to be something keyed in with them. Indeed, the albino population in the very dark ones is worse than in the others too, and even in light people and uh, Caucasians. Uh, but they also identified these variants as well as others associated with dark skin pigmentation in South, uh, South Asian Indian and Australo-Melanesian populations. And uh, so South Asian Indian now separate from what we're talking about, but now we're South Asian Indian, so we've stepped farther that way, not referring it to being East anymore. 
and then Australo Melanesian populations, which are kind of like the Australians, but it's because they found those traits and all the way through to Erie and Jaya and a lot of the island people, and that's your Melanesian populations, Melanesia, who tend to have the darkest skin coloration outside of Africa. So the origin of traits such as hair texture, skin color, and stature, which are shared between some indigenous populations in Melanesia and Australia and some Sub-Saharan Africans, have long been a mystery, Tishkoff said. Some have argued it's because of the convergent evolution, that they have independently evolved these mutations, but our study finds first that at genes associated with skin color, they have the identical variants associated with the dark skin as Africans. Well, anybody that has dark skin is going to have dark skin. Genetics have figured out a long time ago that the Denisovan mix and stuff brings about a Australoid or a Melanesian, and they're not really related to Negroids. Negroids went in a different route. Everybody's in a different route here and stuff. So it's variations on a theme, okay? So when they talk about convergent evolution, one example of this, um, convergent evolution, the best example I could give you when I was studying biology was that there's a vine snake in Africa. It's a green vine snake. looks kind of like, you know, they have the big elephant ear plants and they have a little thing poking out of them. They kind of look like the thing poking out of them. And so they can hang around and wait for something to come by and, then, and grab it and they're kind of in stealth. Well, ironically, on the other side of the globe, we have an almost identical green vine snake that's growing in the Amazon that looks exactly the same, does the same traits, and follows the same path of trying to hide in the bushes. The weird thing is, is whenever we tested them genetically, they're radically different than each other. And so what's happening here is they look almost exactly alike. So this is convergence. This is where over time, just due to natural selection, things that aren't associated still come out the same way, right? Okay. So that's convergence. Anyhow, our data are consistent with the proposed early migration event of modern humans out of Africa along the southern coast of Asia and into Australia, Melanesia, and a secondary migration event into other regions. Mm -hmm. However, it's also possible that there was a single African source population that contained genetic variants associated with both light and dark skin and that the variants associated with Dark pigmentations were maintained in only the South Asians and Austro-Melanesians and lost their Eurasian due to natural selection. Well, that's possible too, but they just said that the lighter came from the Eurasian and the mix of the people that were up there say so they know that's the effect there, but not the effect here. The sun having the lighter skin doesn't seem to be from Caucasian admix. It seems to be from this trigger on your skin pigment set. Also of interest was the genetic variants of MFS D12 and the OCA2 and HERC2 associated with light skin pigmentations. They were at highest frequency in the African sand population, which has the oldest genetic lineages in the world as well as in Europeans. Now I've seen this statement right here. And someone else is trying to throw off, ooh, I know genetics. The funny thing is, is they did not, they cut off as well as in Europeans. So if you had that on, you'd say, oh, the sand population, which is the oldest genetic lineage in the world, as well as Europeans. Well, now looking at it, um, genetically, they can find Negroids really only go back about 12,000 years, and that's a proto-Negroid. And they, it's the oldest one they've found of Negroids at this point. You can look this up, Google it, oldest Negroid skull ever found. Modern Negroids are about 4200 BC. That's it. And then you have these guys that hit at 12K, you know, BC. And so that shows you that it's kind of a recent mutation or a recent adaptation that they've gone through here that uh, it's kind of kin to the, I guess, Cro-Magnon turning modern human which of course they said was around 32,000 BC. Then they figured out it's like 38 BC. Now they figure it's between 60 and 80,000 BC. And they call Caucasians modern humans at that point that we have had small twists from then, but we're still that guy. Whereas the Negroid has actually been a change in a recent time. So, and of course, every time you go through an evolution like this, you'll see it. It's just that we're highly adapted at this one moment in time to see this effect and it happened shorter in time back from the Negroids. It's entirely possible that whites will start going through this different thing where we'll develop wings or something here in the next, you know, thousand generations and switch into a different creature, you know. 
But uh, yeah, I get wings, yeah. Anyhow, so um, MFSD12 is highly expressed in melanocytes, the cells that produce melanin. To verify the gene's role in contributing skin pigmentation, the researchers blocked expression of the gene in cells in culture and found an increase in population of eumelanin. Now, the pigment type responsible for black and brown skin, hair, and eye color. Knocking out the gene in zebrafish caused a loss of cells that produced the yellow pigments. And in mice, knocking out the gene changed the color of their coat from a guti, or a mix, uh, caused by his, hairs that are mixed in with red and yellow pigment, to a uniform gray by eliminating production of phenomelanin, a type of pigment also found in humans and is what's concentrated in more of your Asian and Eurasian and, you know, Caucasoids, I guess, and less of the eumelanin. And so that's why you see a more ruddy appearance in, in whites and so on. It's real strong in Indian, so it's why their skin is red and so on like that. But apart from one study showing that MFD12 was associated with vitiligo lesions, we do know that much, we, we do not, no much else about it, said Crawford, so these functional essays were really crucial. We went beyond most genome-wide associations and studies to uh, do functional essays, Tishkoff said, and found that the knocking out of the MSD12 dramatically impacted the pigmentation of fish and mice. It's pointing to this being a very conserved trait across species. We don't know exactly why, but blocking this gene causes a loss of phenomelon production and an increase of eumelon production. In other words, you would have a lot less of the yellow and red and more of the dark brown black um, expression. And this is indeed what shows up in negroids. We also showed that Africans have a lower level of MSD12 expression, which makes sense as low levels of the gene means more eumelon production. A collaborator on the work, Michael Marks, a professor in the Departments of Pathology, Laboratory Science, and Physical Physiology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and at Penn Medicine demonstrated that the MFS12 gene influences eumelanin pigmentation in a novel manner. Unlike pigmentation genes, which are expressed mainly in the melanosomes, the organelle where melanin is produced, MSC12 expressed in lysosomes, a distinct organelle from the melanosomes, and it produces eumelanin. Ah, so there's a helper and a, a strengthener. There's two things contributing to this darkest skin of negroids that one of which is pretty much turned off on everybody else on the planet. And then if they don't have the eumelanin inversion, there's their skin pigment. So this is your variations on a theme and they're finding out things about it. In addition, Mark said that the facts of loss of MSC12 expression have opposite effects on the two types of melanins. Increasing eumelanin production while suppressing phenomelanin suggests that melanosomes that make phenomelanins might be more related to lysosomes other than that that make eumelanin. So that's the cohabited working together, right? In addition, associations with skin color were found at the OCA2 and HERC2 genes, which have been linked with skin, eye, and hair color variation in Europeans. Although the mutations identified in, uh, are novel, Mutations in OCA2 also cause a form of albinism, which, more com which is more common in Africans or Negroids than in other populations. I wish they would quit using just the plain Africans because North Africa has always been Caucasian and stuff above the Sahara. So you could say sub-Saharan Africans or Negroes or I, I don't know, man. Everything gets offensive to black people nowadays. What the hell do you even call them? Bro? The researchers observed genetic variants in neighboring gene HERC2, which regulates the expression of OCA2. Within OCA2, they identified a variant common in Europeans and SAN that is associated with a shorter version of that protein with an altered function. There's a key. So they observed a signal balancing of section OCA2, meaning that two different variations of the gene have been maintained, in this case, more than 600,000 years. What? Yeah, I think they just said that um, the light gene in people has been found to be from way back. Now, we're finding that we come out of a creature at 1.2 million years ago, and about half that time in time, this is found. So the light skin gene is found 600,000 years ago. What this tells us, said, is that there's likely some selective force maintaining these two alleles. 
it is likely that the gene is playing a role in other aspects of human physiology which are important. A final genetic region the researchers found to be associated with the skin pigmentation includes genes that play a role in ultraviolet response and melanoma risk. The top candidate gene in region DDB1 involved a repairing DNA after exposing to ultraviolet light. Africans don't get melanoma very often, he said. The variants near these genes are highest in populations who live in the highest ultraviolet light intensity, so it makes sense that they may be playing a role in UV protection. Sure, I mean, we, we kind of knew that, but now science is figuring it out. Mutations identified by the team play a role in regulating expressions of DDB1 and other nearby genes, though we don't know the, the mechanism by which DB1 is impacting the pigmentation. It's of interest to note that the gene, which is highly uh, conserved across a species, also plays a role in pigmentation in plants such as tomatoes. I don't know if you know it, but we're supposedly like 92% the same as a banana, you know, 99% the same as a chimp. So a lot of these genes they're finding in things, and you find them in plants, so a lot of things on this planet all have that connection. If you think you have a nature connection, it's a little bit bigger than you think. The team saw evidence that this region of genome has been a strong target for natural selection outside of Africa. Mutations associated with light skin color swept to nearly 100% frequency in non-Africans, one of the few examples of a selective sweep in all Eurasians. The age uh, of the selective sweep was estimated to be around 60 to 80,000 years old, around the time of migration of modern humans out of Africa. Now, we have found that that is the second migration out of Africa, that there's Graecopithics for, for Burgi and all these other guys that have come out, dating it dates farther than this. So they had already been out, and it was actually a coming back in and back out again that had caused this. But So now we're saying there were... Not only was the gene alive at 600,000 years ago, but some 60 to 80,000 years ago, it swept all of everywhere, and everywhere outside of Africa was containing the light genes. So this 8,000 BC kind of thing of this one guy with blue eyes we were talking about earlier is just false, because that guy had a great-grandparent that had it, and that guy had a great-grandparent too, and it doesn't even go back a few generations, it goes back... 80,000 years? No, it goes back 600,000 years, but 80,000 years, it swept over everybody on this end of the planet. You know, the top or half, I guess you'd say, or northern hemisphere. One additional takeaway from this work is a broader picture of the evolution of skin in humans. Most of the genetic variants associated with light and dark pigmentation from the study appear to have originated more than 300,000 years ago. So some half that 600,000 time. And some emerged roughly 1 million years ago. So that puts it back at the common ancestor who held these traits. So, whoa. So, hold on. That common ancestor for both sub-Saharan Negroids, the primate supposedly, that is part of ours. I mean, we, we have a Neanderthal blend and other blends that we have um, and uh, changes that they don't have. But they also have their own Neanderthal type thing they found in their saliva and proteins which shows you that they had their own little thing, which also makes them somewhat different. It may have made triggering points, but also natural selection and things that we're talking about today have made that happen. Um, and some roughly a million years ago, well before the emergence of modern humans. So this is not anything new. The oldest version of these variants in many cases was one associated with lighter skin, suggesting that perhaps the ancestral state of humans was moderately pigmented rather than darkly pigmented skin. I don't know if you catch that. It's kind of in a scientific speak. But what he just said in that last sentence there was, it looks like everybody was lighter skinned and the dark pigmented skin came about later. More of a recent mutation. It's seen in Negroids. So, wow, everybody was black and then a white guy showed up 8,000 years ago. It's now been turned into everybody was kind of lighter skinned and the Negroid thing happened much later. And of course, the turning way light happened a little bit later, but a little bit later is 300,000 to 80,000, 60, 80,000 years ago, not 8,000. If you were to shave a chimp, it has light pigmentation, Tiscott said. So it makes sense that skin color and the ancestors of modern humans would have also been relatively light. It's likely that when we lost hair covering in our bodies and moved from forest to the open savannas, we needed darker skins. Mutations influencing both light and dark skin have been continued to evolve in humans even through the few past thousand years here. 
So sure, and you can find people that live in different areas uh, that develop that due to exposure and things like that, but also into a selection of who you're breeding with and what their little switches are and what can come out of that. And then uh, out of that, which ones are naturally selected and not and so on. Tishkoff noted that the work underscores the diversity of African population and the lack of support of biological notions of race. Many of the genes and new genetic variants we identified to be associated with skin color may never have been found outside of Africa because they are uh, not as highly visible or variable. Tishkoff said there is so much diversity in Africa that's not even been appreciated or it's not often appreciated. There's no such thing as an African race. We show that skin color is extremely variable on the African continent and that it's still evolving. Further, in most cases, the genetic variants associated with light skin arose in Africa. Well, we're not sure that if it arose in Africa, what they have found is that on their return trip back, they already had that going on. And indeed, we find whites outside of Africa going way back 300,000 years, 1.2 million at Great Copithecus for Burgi. So, or Aranthopithecus. Uh, when we look at the things like that, then you have to say that. And when he talked about the chimps earlier, you look at that. Most all chimps are tan skinned if you shaved them all. But then there are recent adaptations. Gorilla is at the end of his tree and he is black skinned. Bonobo is at the end of his tree and he has black skin. So this is a recent mutation. Now I'm wondering if they were to really get into chimps and find that and see how it evolved and then try to compare it to this if they would get anything out of it. But so that whole idea about there ain't been no blue eyed people except for 8,000 years and white people didn't even exist for 8,000 years is really a, a farcical twist. And then genetics, again, as I'm saying, shows you reality of things. And sometimes it's quite different than what people have thought for many, many, many generations. Anyhow, very enlightening here. And I appreciate the guy for shooting it at me, Darth. And, uh, yeah, so like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy this. And if any other uh, case studies come out onto it, I'll try to be on top of them. Appreciate y'all. Have a great evening.